Well, um, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us at this very busy time. Um, today, we're going to have a webinar on COVID-19, fraud risks and the government's response. So perhaps unsurprisingly, um, COVID-19 emergency has led to an increased level of fraud as criminals will seek to take advantage of what is an unprecedented challenge for all of us in society. So over the next 60 minutes, we'll discuss the emerging counter-fraud risks that we're seeing, and we'll hear from Mark Cheeseman, the Director of the Government Counter-Fraud Profession, who'll provide an overview of the government's response. This will be followed by a sip for led discussion on specific threats and risk areas, including procurement fraud. We'll of course wrap up with time for your questions at the end, often the most interesting part of the whole session. Um, so be sure to keep these in mind as we go along. Um, so just before we start then, a, a bit of housekeeping. All of you are actually on mute at the moment, apart from myself and Mark. So if you do have any questions, there's a chat function at the bottom right of your screen. So you can write them in there and then we'll pick up all the questions at the end and address them to either Mark or myself or, you know, speakers that we have so that they can be answered. So please do take advantage of that chat box there. Also, if you have any issues with hearing us or any problems with sound, also use that chat function with that and we'll do our best to help you um, as we're going through the presentation. And finally, just to note that this is being recorded this session this morning, um, so that it'll be available later if you want to share it with colleagues or listen again to specific bits um, in more detail. So that just leaves me to pass over then to Mark, just get his slides up for you. Excellent. So I hope you can see those now. Is that right, Mark? Can you see your slides? Yeah, I can see them. Lovely. Fantastic. So um, over to you then. Perfect. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you ever so much for uh, allowing me to come and speak to you all today about uh, this interesting time uh, and the challenges we face in this time uh, in dealing with the threat from fraud. And I'm more broadly going to talk about the threat from irregular irregularity um, a bit today as well. Uh, because I think you know, I'll explain why later, but but let's start with a bit about me. So my name is Mark Cheeseman. Um, as Laura said, I'm the director of the counter fraud function in government. I'm actually director of the counter fraud function, the debt management function, and the grants management function. But for the last six to seven years of my career, I've spent building up the counter fraud uh, function in government. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about what that is later uh, and then more recently my, my role has broadened out to include those other two functions as well. Uh, I'm also chair of the government's counter fraud profession board and was part one of the 16 founding members organisations of that initiative um, and that profession. Um, most recently as well I've just returned, well I just returned in um, uh, February from Australia where I spent some time working with the Australian government to replicate what the centre of the UK government uh, has set up for central government uh, in terms of how we deal with fraud, which is the functional agenda. So for those of you who don't know, I'll just talk briefly about the functional agenda, because I think that will help to set some context for what I'm then going to talk about, about how the centre of government is dealing with the fraud threat that arises out of COVID-19. So government functions bring together all those people who are working in common areas across government. One of the challenges we have in central government is we have 20 odd government departments, 243 public bodies, and all of those individual departments are individually accountable to parliament. And traditionally, all of those departments have worked out for themselves what they do. So if you're working on projects, if you're working on finance, if you're working on counter fraud, uh, the individual departments and public bodies would work out for themselves what right looked like in that. Um, what the functional agenda does is bring together those areas and say, rather than everyone work them out for this out for themselves, why don't we uh, work, learn across the system and work out across the system, drawing on the expertise across those organisations uh, rather than just within. And I think that's really helpful, um, certainly from a counter fraud perspective in the modern world, because fraud has got, and, and dealing with fraud, has got more and more complicated. Uh, with the advent of digital um, and increased um, attacks on systems, um, fraud is not what it was before. And actually the number of disciplines we use from risk assessment to investigation, to forensics, to data and analytics, to changing cultures, to measuring the fraud problem, are so diverse that actually it's it's quite an expectation for an organisation to know what good looks like in that, um, whilst also knowing what good looks like in legal, HR, projects, communications, commercial, all the other functions. So government has seen some 
great benefits in bringing together this picture. And, and, and the example I always use when I talk about this is, is just the learnings we can leverage on investigation. So before I came to the cabinet office, I used to run uh, the fraud function in the legal aid agency and was part of the wider Ministry of Justice fraud response. Um, now, in the legal aid agency, we did about nine to 10 prosecutions a year. Um, Department for Work and Pensions at that time was doing 10,000 and Revenue and Customs was doing about 6,000. Which organisation is learning quicker about how to do how to investigate and do prosecutions and learning what goes wrong? The answer is pretty clear. It's those big departments. They're learning much, much quicker. It would take me years to learn what they learn in weeks. Um, so actually, the functional model really builds off that. And rather than expecting every organisation to work it out for themselves, it just shares rather than expecting every organisation. So when I started in Ministry of Justice, I went out and met with a lot of organisations and asked what they're doing on fraud. Rather than expect every organisation to pull what um, is working on fraud, it pushes across the system that leading practice and brings together the experts to advise on that leading practice. So functions do three things. Um, they set standards for work, um, they develop capability within the people working in that area, and then they give expert advice both to those accountable and to, um, uh, to other parts of the system. So for instance, I give expert advice to Treasury and um, uh, number 10 on some of the challenges. Um, the capital function government, uh, central government has 15,000 people working across the system, just over 15,000 actually. Um, so actually the developing capability and setting standards has, has quite a big impact across the centre of government. And what have we done to date? Well, we developed a functional standard which said the minimum that organisations should do to deal with fraud. Um, um, by, by we, that is not the Cabinet Office team um, which I used to lead, that is the, um, the whole, that is the 18 organisations and their experts coming together to agree what that standard should be. Uh, we developed and launched the Government Account Fraud Profession, of which there are now over 6,000 members and a live apprenticeship scheme. Uh, we developed a number of initiatives to reduce fraud, which have had impacts of hundreds of millions of pounds, which I can talk about wider. We did a number of data pilots, really pushed the data agenda. We run the National Fraud Initiative, which those of you from local authorities will be aware of. Uh, and we also did, um, pushed across the system a lot of guidance and training on things like how to do data pilots, how to measure fraud, all kinds of stuff and some of that guidance I will refer to later. Uh, so uh, let's move on to the next slide briefly if that's all right. So these are just the principles of fraud and corruption from the International Public Sector Fraud Forum. When we'd brought government together one of the things that our ministers then challenged us to do was this is great in terms of how the UK is dealing with it, how does what happened in other countries compare to what the UK is doing? And from that, we developed something called the International Public Sector Fraud Forum, which is where leading experts from the five eyes on managing public sector fraud or fraud against the public sector meet. We meet on a bi-monthly basis and we have um, half yearly face-to-face -face meetings, although they're less likely to happen in the current circumstances. Uh, but that, um, that group has now come together where we share quite detailed practice and these are the principles to managing fraud and corruption that we have agreed on there. So how has COVID-19 changed all of this? Well, I think it's fair to say that the landscape in the public sector has changed dramatically in the last few months. We face an unprecedented challenge at an unprecedented pace. Now, there have been many other big challenges, but if I take Brexit as an example, the pace with which we're dealing with COVID-19 as a challenge is much quicker than it, than it was uh, with Brexit at the time. Um, and I'm not yeah, sure if you go back in history, we had the Second World War, the First World War, um, the Spanish flu pandemic and things like that. But I mean, for our generation, the pace of what we're dealing with and the scale of what we're doing in the centre of government is unprecedented for us as we as leaders and those working in the public sector try to grapple with how we deal with it. Um, Public servants across the system are working exceptionally hard to get us through this and that includes many of you on the call and many of you who will listen later who will be spending a lot of your time working long hours while balancing a very different um, living arrangements to those you're used to I expect as well um, uh, and that's the administrators in government, the civil servants, the public servants, those in local authorities um, and that's also obviously the frontline staff in the NHS who, uh, who by social distancing we're trying to protect to ensure we get through this pandemic as best we can. 
the government response is at pace and scale because there's there's three there's lots of things we're trying to do but i'm going to pick out three things in particular that we're trying that we're doing um, which affect our fraud risk so first of all we're buying supplies and equipment for the nhs at, at, at a huge pace uh, you'll have heard a lot of these in the news so we're buying uh, personal protective equipment uh, we're buying and encouraging organizations to construct ventilators uh, and we're trying to buy um, and buying um, tests, uh, both antibody tests and um, other tests to uh, identify, increase the amount of testing that we do in the country and identify who has and may have had COVID-19. In addition, we're building new hospitals, well, not building in the way China has, but we are, we are implementing new hospitals, the Nightingale hospitals. All of that is hu a huge endeavour in itself. Secondly, we are, um, the Treasury has unlocked um, stimulus funding to support uh, individuals and businesses through the pandemic. And to date, the, um, the stimulus funding runs at about 420 billion that's been committed. Um, that's through 53 different schemes delivered through 12 departments and all local authorities and tens of other public bodies. That in itself, again, is a complex endeavor. Every year, government spends about 700 billion pounds um, we are increasing the pace and scale of what we do significantly to get us through this crisis. Thirdly, we're facing um, unprecedented demand on our public services. Um, the example I'll give for that is universal credit. So universal credit traditionally would receive about 9,000 um, applications a month, uh, a week, sorry. Um, at its peak, universal credit was getting 105,000 applications every week. Now, all of these things are also aligned to the fact that we're many of us are working in ways that we've never worked before. Uh, we're more isolated, we're less easy to in, easy, easily able to engage with our colleagues. Um, many of us are working in more highly pressurised environments where the pace is, is, is noticeable um, and having to work from home and balance childcare and other things at the same time. A lot of this leads to the fact that we're doing things in a higher pressure environment and in a more concentrated manner at a higher pace. So I want to go now on to the next slide and talk about what we're doing to deal with it. So I talked about the International Public Sector Fraud Forum earlier. Last, um, when I was in Australia, um, was during the bushfire crisis. Uh, and one of the things I worked with our international fire vice colleagues on during the bushfire crisis was developing um, an emergency management guide for the public sector as to how you deal with emergency management. The main purpose of that at that time was to help the Australian government deal with um, uh, deal with the bushfires because I was there for a short period of time and they're still working on the, the bushfires and how that works and what I wanted was I was advising them quite a lot on how to deal with um, fraud in the, as a result of the bushfires. Um, I wanted uh, there to be a product which they could use and frame um, stuff on later. So the experts in the five eyes, this includes us, America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia and ourselves, came together to talk about what working in emergency management is and what it means when you're, do, when you're dealing with fraud. Um, and this is actually published on the internet. So if anyone, um, anyone very welcome to link in to me and attach to me and you'll, you'll be able to see it through my LinkedIn feed. Uh, you'll also just be able to search for it on the internet uh, if you're not someone who uses LinkedIn. But we agreed overall that there are five overarching principles to how you deal with fraud and emergency management. And the first one is pretty key. The first is that we have to accept there is an inherently higher risk of fraud and it is very likely to happen. So our US colleagues, for instance, talked about how in Hurricane Katrina, they saw extensive levels of fraud from people wanting to game the system. And that's either organized crime taking advantage of the system or it's people taking advantage of the system because they, you know, they, they see an opportunity or it's people in difficult circumstances because of the impact of the natural disaster or in our case pandemic on them taking meaning that those those uh, circumstances shift that fraud triangle that those of you who work on fraud um, will uh, know about and increase the motivation or the rationalization of why they would commit fraud when we're working at pace as well we're often unable to put in the uh, controls because we have to focus on frictionless controls um, the controls that we need to um, not we need to, that's wrong, but the controls we would normally do if we were working at a slower pace. So we have to accept, and one of the main roles I play in the centre is working with departments, with Treasury, with ministers, to accept there's going to be a higher risk of fraud. 
the temptation is to say, right, we have to pay out faster, but we'll have to reduce fraud. And, and we've got to accept there's a tension there and actually there will be a higher risk of fraud and it is likely to happen while we're doing these circumstances because we need to push money out quicker because that's the right thing to do. Um, and we need to uh, reduce controls in some places to do that. The second general, general principle then is to integrate the fraud control resources, which is people, um, into the policy and process to build awareness of fraud. The best way to deal with fraud is to understand the risks, understand the way people will attack the system. Um, and the, the model we, we struck on in Australia and we've used um, in the UK as well, is actually if you put capable, experienced fraud, counter fraud people, not necessarily fraud investigation staff, but fraud risk staff, into those environments, they can pick up on the risks and do the work for the business to make sure they understand them. Thirdly, uh, you work to implement low friction countermeasures to prevent risk wherever possible. Uh, and much of that, um, the advice you'll see in the guide, if you look at it, is around using pre-existing processes and things like that wherever possible and exploring low risk countermeasures. I really want to focus on the fourth area because this is something we're thinking a lot about. And that is the acceptance that because we are making payments quicker uh, and because uh, we are not able to do some of the checks that we would do normally or explore some of the risks in the, over the length of time we would do normally, we need to put more focus into post-event assurance. And putting more focus into post-event assurance is about two things. One is about making sure we have mechanisms in the system to get the money back if it goes out incorrectly. But the second is then about thinking about what the risks are, which in the structure from the International Public Sector Fraud Forum would be through the fraud risk assessments, um, and I would advise as well, um, and the embedded resources that are doing that. Um, understand what the risks are and then do activity which targets trying to find fraud or irregular payments in that in those areas. And I, I, I'm bringing in irregular payments again because actually Depending on how we're making these payments, sometimes it'll be fraud, sometimes it'll be irregular. If we're pushing payments out to individuals, often that will mean that there was unlikely to be fraud because they won't have declared or not declared something. We'll have just given them money. That does not mean still for government, we don't want to get that money back if that went out incorrectly. So we've found in the central government, actually fraud and error management, irregularity management are a lot closer tied together in these more compressed circumstances than they, than they have been previously. The final point, which is something for the future for us, is to be mindful from the shift of the managing the crisis into the longer term rebuilding, because what can happen, um, and our Australian colleagues and our American colleagues talk to this, is that um, actually the practices that are developed under the crisis re uh, remain for too long. And the shortened processes, the quick way of getting money out, uh, goes on for longer than it actually needs to without review and implementation of more control and more post-event assurance. So that's something else that we keep in mind too. Uh, so if we can move on to the next slide, Laura. So what have we done uh, in the centre of government? Well, we've really, we've bought that it's, everything is compressed. So what we've really focused on is bringing the function together again. Um, and what we've done is I, uh, the team I used to lead in the centre of the cabinet office, uh, is the Centre of Expertise, which um, coordinates the function, brings all the organisations and experts together to form the function. We've reshaped that team to support departments and public bodies in the response. And that team is the Cabinet Office COX COVID-19 team. Um, now, um, the, to the, to the right-hand side there, you've got all the governance that goes on there, but we set up boards, we are civil servants, so to bring people together and engage across both across the business, across our international partners, across the other sectors to get them in. We, we, we form boards and groups to do that. So that just is a bit of information for you there on how that's working. But I just want to target in on because it will give you an idea what the, actually the team is doing in bringing together people from the function. So the first area is the risk and research team. So the risk and research team is understanding the spending. So I already said there's over 420 billion going through 53 different schemes understand the spending that, that's going on and the issues with it. They then undertake a desk-based global fraud risk assessment using the government standard for fraud risk assessments to understand what those risks are um, and to understand where we should prioritise efforts and where the highest risk areas are. In addition, what they then do is they source fraud risk assessment experts from across the public sector and offer them to be embedded in the departments who are doing similar spend. So that goes back to that second, uh, third principle, I think it was on embedding resource. No, second principle was embedding resource, sorry. 
they then flow that those risk assessments from those departments flow back into the center who then share them back out so we're just sharing intelligence sharing knowledge across the system that enables us to prioritize at the center where we should put our efforts and support um, and uh, where the biggest challenges may be the second team is the countermeasures team so from that prioritization we then embed countermeasure support and they split into three areas. One are the people who are in the programs. So what that basically means is if one program is uh, the job retention scheme, for instance, and we'd embedded some countermeasure resource uh, into there, um, then that, that, that would be one of the teams that's working there. So the programs divided up by the different areas that we've prioritized. The second is the products team who are at pace developing products to help and taking the products that are being developed in individual government departments and deploying them elsewhere. So, for instance, a government department I know is developing a product to manage one of their fraud risks. That products team is working with them to develop that and shaping it so it can be deployed into other government departments when they need it. Learning across the system rather than in those individual departments. And there's a few products that are going on that. I'm going to touch on Spotlight a bit later because I have a slide on it, uh, which is a check against Companies House and some other data sources to find out whether companies are real or real or not and, and how they work. But we're also using government's identity tool, Verify, and different versions of that to try and help with people deal with identity threat. We've developed a new uh, tool that checks bank, um, bank uh, individuals to bank accounts to check whether someone is there and also identifies which bank accounts are offshore and onshore or linked to offshore accounts and things like that to try and prevent against some of that. So developing a number of products. And then third thing the countermeasures team has is a pilots team because we still try and pilot a lot of this stuff first because the danger is if you do a big solution in one go in these emergency environments, the system could topple because of it or it could just give you a load of problems you don't know how to deal with. And with all uses of data and countermeasures to fight fraud, um, there are they give indicators they don't always show all the fraud the other countermeasures the team work on are standard things like fraud clauses which you'd expect reporting lines um, uh, and they've developed a countermeasures toolkit which they share with all departments which brings me on to my next area so that's the functional capacity and guidance team uh, sorry it's slide before still uh, Laura uh, yeah um, that's the functional capacity and guidance team so the functional capacity and guidance team first thing it does is share guidance across all departments and public bodies. So I said we had to prioritize. Where we can't prioritize, we then share guidance, products, and get and develop things that people can access so they know what's going on and they can choose whether they want to invest in it. The second thing we do is we keep an eye on business as usual fraud and resources. So for instance, in universal credit, uh, applications have increased by 800%, fraud resources have reduced. Uh, we keep an eye on that situation so we know the problem we may be storing up for the future. It's not just about the fraud risk and the stimulus spend, it's about the changes in the fraud risk and threat in government business as usual arrangements and how we're going to deal with that post event. Final thing then is the governance threat and stakeholders team. Um, and what they do is they bring together the wider picture. So we very much focus generally in the counter fraud function on businesses uh, on fraud against the public sector. Actually, the whole of the central government community has said, because we're in a crisis situation, we just all need to work together on the whole picture. So we sit on a number of boards which look at the business threat, the individual threat, ensure flows of intelligence between the banks and the public sector and the police, and that everyone is aware of the picture in a way that we've never been before. Because actually, if we're gonna be agile and deal with some of these threats quickly, we need to all know about it. And that, for instance, has, so I don't know whether you guys got the gov.uk, gov underscore UK text, I'm sure you did. Um, so what that does, for instance, is um, that enables us to deal with that incredibly quickly when that started being spoofed and put guidance and put controls in uh, because it all just got shared between those who are identifying it, the police, us, uh, the threat to the individual and the impact on the public sector. All that just flowed in um, really well. So I just want to touch the next slide, uh, Laura, and I'm almost done. Sorry, I've overrun my time a little bit. Um, no problem at so all. So the other two, interesting. Pardon? Oh, sorry. Anyway, um, so the other thing uh, that uh, the other two functions that um, I am responsible for are the grants function, the debt function. So the grants function, one of the tools in the project products bit of the countermeasures team is Spotlight, which is a due, due diligence risking tool. And I'm going to give an example of how that's been used by local authorities in the uh, business rate relief and um, uh, leisure uh, rate relief. 
um, schemes. So over 200 local authorities have taken on Spotlight and Spotlight is a tool that takes data on the companies that you're looking to pay, compares it to Companies House and compares it to a number of other government data sources and flags. In the last week, that's enabled 24 million pounds worth of irregular payments to be identified before they were made, which was local authorities who had organizations on their books who actually were dissolved, uh, didn't exist anymore. Um, so deploying tools like this are really helpful. Uh, and we are deploying this, we also deploy this, it won't surprise you to hear, into the purchasing going on in health. Uh, we're deploying this tool across the system. And this is a new tool. This only came online towards the end of last year um, as a tool and as an operational tool. Um, the grants team are also putting out, because a lot of this government money is going through grants. So the grants function is putting out guidance on how to deliver grants, what the best practice is. Again, it's using that functional model to rather than let everyone work it out for themselves, saying here is the combined learning of government of how you do this stuff. Here is here it's now up to you to choose how you do it. So we haven't mandated the use of Spotlight by anyone. We've just strong, we strongly encouraged it because as the results show, it will reduce spending. That 24 million is 3% um, of the money that's gone through um, Spotlight. Now that, that 24 million can now be used for other things. And we're gonna need money for in, in, as we get out of this to spend on other areas and other issues. Um, so that's what the grants function is doing. The debt function is also playing an important role so, for instance, you'd have seen a lot in the in the news about the relaxation of debt recovery, stopping bailiffs going round to um, people whilst we're in social um, social distancing and in isolation, um, uh, basically easing the the burden on the individual um, uh, during um, during uh, this this time. Uh, and the debt function was was working with the centre of government to pull together those proposals. The other thing we worked on, which I we'll mentioned before, was the clawback of irregular spend. So what powers can government use to claw back irregular spend and make sure we can get that money back? Because we have to accept that some of it is going to go out incorrectly and we'll have to do post event insurance. So getting the powers in and getting people's awareness of setting that expectation that if the money goes out incorrectly, it will come back is another important thing they've been working on. And finally, what they've been thinking about is when we um, leave this current state and start opening up society a bit more, how do we restart government debt collection? What we don't want to do is say, right, we're out of, we're out of the current um, phase tomorrow, government debt collection is back on. That will just bring um, challenges to communities um, and uh, bring problems. So actually, what is the right way to restart debt collection in a way that does not disrupt uh, the economic and individual and community recovery um, at the end of our current phase? So the functions you can see are working together, all working in that functional model of bringing together experts from across the system to do this stuff and sharing and pushing that learning out across the system. I just want to mention one thing, then I'll wrap. One thing um, is data specification. So this is from the countermeasures team. I've talked about the importance we feel of post-event assurance because of the higher risk at the front end. Um, and we are doing some work across the centre of government to bring together what we're going to do on post-event assurance um, for a lot of this spending. Um, at the heart of doing, being able to do that is, a, is making sure we collect good quality data up front to enable us to do data matching and analyse that data. If we have poor quality data, we will not be able to do very good post-event assurance. And it's not as simple as good or bad data. These things are on a continuum, right? So. Um, but part of that the countermeasures team has done is developed a data specification of those of you working in local authorities would have seen the guidance from the National Fraud Initiative uh, and the advice from uh, MHCLG and Bayes on the collection of data um, for, uh, for some of the grants going out. All of that is driven by the experts um, from P the experts saying um, this is the data that we will need to uh, do post event assurance to a good quality. We all then take choices as to what extent we get that data, but we have to accept if we don't collect that data, our opportunities to deal with this problem at the back end will be limited. So, what's government to doing? Well, we're trying to bring the system together in central government to learn together at pace in a compressed environment, a highly stressed environment with challenges that we've never seen before in this generation. We're building off the foundation we made with the function. Um, we are trying to ensure that all organisations accept there is going to be fraud and irregularity in this environment, and that is not a failure, that is part of dealing with crises. That is an inherent part of what happens.
We're sharing learning and best practice across the system. Uh, we're dealing with it as a business problem and one that can be measured. And why are we doing that? Well, firstly, we're doing it because we want to maintain the confidence of the public that actually we are using taxpayers' money sensibly and we're making sure support goes to those who need it, not just goes. Secondly, we're trying to make sure the money goes as far as possible because actually 420 billion is a lot of money um, and it is in it, it is a duty of all of us as public servants to make sure that that money goes as far as possible and is used in the best way to uh, support communities and individuals in getting through this crisis. And finally, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. That's all I had to say, Laura. Great, thank you very much, Mark, for that informative overview of everything that the government is doing. That's been great. Um, I'm just reminded to everyone that there is a chat box if you have any questions for Mark. Um, we'll take them at the end and it'll be great to have his views and thoughts on that. Um, thank you again, that was fantastic. So I'm just going to switch now to talk more about some of the fraud risks that we're seeing emerging as a result of the circumstances. So just give me one minute. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much. Mark, I'm just going to meet you along with everyone else. So feel free to answer your phone or drink your coffee or whatever you are about to do. Um, brilliant. OK, excellent. So um, COVID-19 situation has obviously brought forward lots of the old fraud risks and scams that we've seen before, repurposed, refurbished and used in a new way. And um, as people take advantage of the situation and the support that's being offered um, from government that Mark has just been talking about. Um, so over the next kind of 10 to 15 minutes, I just wanted to go through some of the scams that we're seeing, some of the fraud types and um, discuss a few pieces of guidance that we've put out there um, just recently. So for those of you who joined us on the 31st of March, you will have heard about the um, research that we just commissioned from an organization called Perpetuity Research. Um, tackling fraud in the public sector a local government perspective, took an in-depth look at fraud using the perspectives of professionals within UK local authorities. These range from counter-fraud professionals to heads of service delivery. This research was completed actually before COVID-19 was on the horizon and the associated emergency response was not yet thought about. In this pre-COVID-19 world though, the research did highlight that 64% of senior council officers viewed fraud as a major problem. So in the current situation where there's more uncertainty with increased pressure and stretched resources, the risks of experiencing fraud for all of us are bound to increase, you know, as Mark has also been saying um, earlier on. But why more specifically do we say that there'll be a heightened risk during this um, emergency? I suppose from my perspective, there are many factors that contribute to the heightened level of risk and fraudsters and organised criminals will have absolutely no qualms about taking advantage of these situations. I mean, to start with, given the necessary levels of urgency in delivery, this raises questions about whether it's possible to build in any time to do any due diligence and ensure that the suppliers, staff and volunteers that we're working with are appropriately verified. I mean, will there be time to check invoices against corresponding purchase orders when there's a lot of pressure to pay out to suppliers to keep them afloat and to keep the contingency of supply in place? There might be a need to work with previously unknown suppliers, get partners in quickly to deliver services that we previously have not been involved with as an organisation. I mean, how does one balance onboarding processes for new providers against the need to get them up and running very quickly? From an organisational perspective, staff resources will be stretched, perhaps due to illness or because staff members have been redeployed to frontline services or new tasks within your organisation. The stretch resources can have an impact on the ability to maintain any segregation of duties and raises questions as to whether it would be possible to conduct any monitoring because you don't have the resource and if indeed it's feasible to monitor in any case in the current um, lockdown situation. Will your counter fraud team and resources be available to carry out any counter fraud work or will they be redeployed onto other services and other duties? Will all the referrals that maybe come through in this crisis period 
be saved up for the end when your counter fraud staff are back to their normal jobs or will they be ignored or deleted accidentally? So you have to think about capturing all of that information too. There's also a risk associated with redeploying staff members onto unknown activities or tasks. You know, potentially that might leave your organisation vulnerable to fraudsters who would be quick to take advantage of people who don't know quite what the usual processes are and in a situation where training might have to be minimal due to stretch resources and time constraints, there could be a gap there. There'll also be a heightened risk coming from increased remote working. How do you guarantee information security in the myriad of home offices that now constitute your organisation? How can you be sure what your staff and partners are really delivering and doing when you can't see what they're doing and physically monitor the activities? It's not really possible. You know, individual staff members can also become more vulnerable to online frauds and scams if they're working at home, particularly if their own online security is not up to date or if they're using non-organisational laptops or their own devices because they haven't got access to desktops, for example, in the office. I always find um, Cressy's fraud triangle quite useful to think of in these circumstances, which I've put down there at the right. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this model, it sets out the situation in which fraud may occur. So an individual has a motivation or pressure to commit a fraud, where there is, they also have the perception that there's an opportunity to do so and where they're able to rationalise their acts and convince themselves that they haven't really done anything wrong. So in this circumstance, increased levels of financial hardship and uncertainty due to the COVID-19 situation might act as a motivator for financial gain, reduced levels of due diligence, or the opportunity for government assistance might provide that perceived opportunity. And then the fear of COVID-19 and the fear of what happens in the future might provide a good rationalisation for someone you know, I'm only doing what anyone else would do in my situation if they had to deal with this as well. So I think it's always it's always good to keep that at the back of one's mind um, when thinking about any emergency situation. So many of these you will have, have seen before in the past. And as I said, they're being repurposed to fit the new COVID-19 scenario and um, in many ways would be tried and tested for the, the seasoned fraudster, unfortunately. So one type that never really goes away um, is that of mandate fraud. So when somebody gets you to change a direct debit, a standing order or bank transfer payment by claiming to be an organisation you work with regularly. So whether that's one of your suppliers, a subscription service or somebody else, the builder that did the work on your house, somebody might get in between that and pretend to be that organisation um, instead of them. So you need to be alert to that in, in all circumstances, but particularly now when we're doing things at pace. So with the level of support that government is, is providing, um, there's unfortunately the prime opportunity for fraudsters to impersonate claimants for assistance, or indeed staff or volunteers could exploit um, those in receipt of help. For example, you know, one thing we see quite a lot at the moment is individuals going from door to door claiming to be health workers, providing tests or selling tests to individuals that obviously fake um, or you know fake claims for charitable donations that never really reach the charity they're being collected for so it's always important to do do your checks on, on these kind of situations linked to the above there might be fictitious companies or charities applying for assistance or indeed genuine companies or individuals applying for assistance in slightly desperate circumstances when they're not entitled to it companies might be claiming furlough assistance for staff that are ghost employees that don't really exist and companies might have closed already in 2019 or 2018, but making claims for support, even though they already cease training, trading well in advance of coronavirus epidemics. In times of making urgent payments, it can be difficult to build in sufficient time in advance to conduct the necessary checks that you do in a normal situation. So this reinforces really the importance of good record keeping and the need for post-event assurance and due diligence after the event to be possible because you've got those records. In our digital world, we've seen such an increase in, in vulnerabilities, so phishing emails and text messages being used to exploit individuals concerned about the virus or exploiting financial pressures that people are under as a result. So asking, for example, people to provide bank details to ensure that they continue to get free school meals for their children or requesting an upfront fee in exchange for a job opportunity that never materialises. You know, I've heard of an example in Germany where clones of government websites are are being made um, to dupe individuals and companies into sharing their genuine information that is then used by fraudsters through these fake websites on the uh, official websites to claim for the assistance themselves. So the fraudsters are getting in the middle and claiming that assistance rather than the genuine claimants. 
Um, one area of particular concern to me is that to do with the procurement and your supply chains. Um, for example, are there fictitious or unqualified companies entering the supply chain due, due to the speed of delivery? Or is there overcharging or duplicate claims for existing suppliers? Um, because again, of the speed and the lack of time built in to, to verify that. There's also quite a drive towards, if necessary, using single sourcing. Um, and this could present an opportunity for the unscrupulous individual to take advantage and make sure that their preferred supplier gets into the supply chain in exchange for a kickback. And I think many of these risks you need to be alert to, not only in your professional context, but also within a, per a personal capacity. <clears throat> so by way of background, there have just been a, several new public procurement notices published over the last few weeks um, to deal with the response to COVID-19. Two of them which, which stand out to me really as one called Responding to COVID-19, which focuses on the need to procure goods, works and services in extreme urgency. And the second about supplier relief due to COVID-19, which sets out information and guidance for public bodies on the payment of their suppliers to ensure service continuity. So the emphasis on, on both of these is about delivering at pace and ensuring that your suppliers continue to be paid in these circumstances of uncertainty and ensuring that you continue to be able to procure goods, works and services as quickly as you can. So this delivery at pace is obviously slightly at odds with the need to do lots of due diligence and verification on where the money's going and how you're spending it. So there's obviously this tension and, and that needs balancing in the current scenario when obviously it's right and proper to ensure that those in need are really getting the help as quickly as they can um, in this circumstance. What also struck me on, on reading through these um, PPNs was just that what this would mean for the counter-fraud professional and their idea of the usual red flag or indicator of a potential fraud being having taken place. I mean, many of the red flags you might rely on as an indicator, perhaps a, an increased use of single sourcing or individuals within your organization pressuring for an urgent payment to a supplier, these really fall away in, an, in a situation of extreme urgency. So rather than being indicative of potential fraud or non-compliance or irregularity, might merely be instead indicative of the emergency response. So this might take some unwinding after the fact for the, those of us in the counter-fraud profession seeking to understand what these indicators might mean and how to spot those potential fraud cases. So in response to the um, heightened risks of fraud in the supply chain and the procurement cycle, CIPFRA and the LGA have jointly produced a short guide reminding us of the risks of fraud in the supply chain and possible mitigation steps. Um, the note acts as really a reminder of the continuing risks to supply chains posed by fraud and corruption, just highlighting a few of those areas that will be exacerbated by emergency circumstances. The guide covers a number of areas, but things like fictitious and unqualified suppliers, product substitution and the, the high risks you have there, you know, particularly important in the case of medical supplies in the, in the current situation, touches on supplier collusion and cartel activity, which are difficult to spot at the best of times, um, let alone in such constrained circumstances as we have now. Also touching on um, the misappropriation of assets and potentially how this is increased by the fact that we're all working remotely, where are things being delivered to, where are they being stored, how are they being accessed, it all becomes a lot more complicated in such a remote working environment. The guidance concludes also with some simple steps really on how to protect your organisation. Much of this is not new, but serves as a timely reminder in these pressurised circumstances when the need to deliver can sometimes overwhelm the time you have to stop and think about anything. SIPFA has also partnered with Stradia to develop online open book contract management training. And the details are there in the link on the slide and we'll forward this all around to you afterwards. Just to finish off then, um, with a link to some additional resources that might be of use during this time. So the Cabinet Office link to information there, which Mark touched upon earlier. Obviously, our SIP for Counter Fraud Centre. The Fraud Advisory Panel has a watch group that meets on a weekly basis at the moment to discuss new and emerging trends, and, and they publish that information on their website, so it's worth checking that out. National Cyber Security Centre produces excellent guidance on how to deal with suspicious emails, has a weekly threat report. And also there's the Take 5 campaign, which I'm sure many of you are already aware of, um, as well as the National Crime Agency, which 
provides news and updates on the scams and frauds that they're seeing coming through. I suppose um, one thought that also occurs to me is that that maybe with such high profile um, circumstances and frauds occurring in this crisis situation, it might be a, a glimmer of hope that we could see more resources being invested in counter fraud across the board um, as a result of dealing with this um, crisis afterwards. Excellent. Well, thank you very much um, all for listening. I'm going to move now to looking at the questions that we've got coming through. So let's see what we have here. So, so the first question then, I think is, I'm going to unmute you again, Mark. Perfect. There we are. Mark, I think you might have to unmute yourself as well, actually. Yeah, done. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so the first question is, um, we are being inundated with bank app um, checker offers, so SciFast, Nafin, Experian, and you talked about the apps that you've developed as well. Which one's being supported by government and can you give any advice on which is most appropriate? So, I mean, sadly, the answer is going to be no on that. Um, Okay. So what's happening in this what's happening in this circumstance is we are operating at pace. So both those Cyfas, Nafin, Experian, all all loads of others, Equifax, Indesa, um, I could I could do a long list mm -hmm. of companies who have all said actually we want to help. And what they've done is they've reached out to us, they've reached out to local authorities, they've reached out to public bodies. Yeah. And they've all got different tools. We have we I said about prioritization. I mean, the team in the middle is is only a small team. So actually, we have prioritized a few of those which we are develop which we are working on. However, I we haven't had the capacity to look at all the other tools and say which ones would fit your fraud problem. Sadly, that's something you'll have to do yourself. Over time, we'll get to more of them, but which one would fit your fraud problem is a, 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 uh, is a challenge. And and Jeff, I would in response to your question, I'll say that well, actually which product is right for you depends on what your fraud problem is and what spending you're looking at in doing it does that make sense so paying paying to businesses where you're not sure if they are still in existence spotlight is a good tool mm -hmm. uh, so you need the tool that fits the problem that you're trying to solve effectively exactly yeah paying universal credit payments or support yeah. to individuals Spotlight is not a very helpful tool for that Absolutely. so you need the tool that fits your problem um so I don't think we're going to get to the point during this crisis where government is going to be re recommending tools beyond the ones that we are working on, where we will come out with a product kind of description and we'll say we recommend this for these type of risks mm -hmm. or to help with these type of risks. Yeah. yeah. But the nuance of the risk you face will depend on the processes you use as well. And all local authorities and all public bodies are using slightly different processes because historically they've done things in their own way. Mm -hmm. um, so my my over time, we may come out with some here are some helpful products like we have with um, Spotlight. We've been involved in the development of Spotlight through the grants management function, so we understand it. We also understand Verify. Um, what I don't want to give is advice on things we don't understand. Um, but what I'd encourage you all to do is to be really challenging with those who are coming forward about what fraud risks they deal with and what they don't and what the limitations of their tools are. So we've learned two things, two kind of sayings that we share across central government all the time and we live by. Um, one is problem, not product. It's not about the product, it's about the problem. And then does the product fit the problem? Number two, limitations, not strengths. Whenever one of those companies is coming to you to talk to you about a product, they will set, tell you all their strengths. But actually, whenever you implement the product, what you'll find out is all their weaknesses as well. You'll best be able to choose which products or, or things to help you if you really understand their weaknesses. And if they don't understand the weaknesses of their products, that probably tells you something. So those are the things we use in the center whenever we start one of these conversations. Problem, not product. Weaknesses, not strengths. Excellent. That's very, very good. Uh, two very succinct catchphrases, I think there, Mark. Very helpful. Um, so will guidance be provided in respect of post-event assurance that should be undertaken to look for in respect of grants to businesses? Is that are you producing guidance, I think, is the general question more broadly? Yeah, um, in the centre, potentially. So I've just brought together the group um, that is going to do that. 
um, um, from different functions and different departments, which is going to decide whether we do create um, a standard or guidance, and we're probably going to create guidance. Um, the extent to which that is then advisory or or whatever will be up to that group as it develops. Our strong view as a central account for all function is that people should be taking post undertaking post event assurance. They mm -hmm. should understand their risks and undertake it. Um, over time, we will develop guidance on what that looks like. The extent to which that goes out to local authorities will be a choice for MHCLG, I would feel. Okay. Um, uh, but um, we're quite open in what we share, um, so we, we, you know, we would make we would make that available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I suppose a follow up to that is another question about whether post event assurance is the key action area that local government should be including in their post crisis management and recovery plans. As Mark Cheeseman from the Cabinet Office, mm -hmm. Director of the Cabinet Office, my advice is that under the localism agenda, that is up for the individual local authorities to decide themselves as to what they should do. Yeah. As Mark Cheeseman, one of the lead experts on fraud management um, in the centre of government, I would say yes. <laughs> you should definitely be thinking about that. Um, <laughs> uh, the Cabinet Office isn't going to tell you you should do it. No. Um, but me as a fraud expert would say, you should think you should really be yeah that should be a key part of how you exit certainly the conversation we're having in the center of government for all the stimulus areas that we are managing and all the operational areas that have had higher demand like universal credit and startup loans and things like that um we are that is a key part of our of what we're, of, of the uh the post plan that we are looking at mm -hmm. fantastic and um, there's lots of questions about this actually but um so simon's asking whether as the guidance is still pending in relation to powers to recover grants paid out, what should we do in the interim if we think there's something potentially fraudulent has happened? So, my, so again, um, you, my, my advice, my personal advice, not cabinet office official advice, sure. yeah. is we should focus on trying to get the money back. So Simon, I can see in your question, you're saying, should we investigate? Um, well, it's up to you whether you investigate, right? An investigation is already a choice. When I ran Legal Aid, we had hundreds of allegations a year and we investigated about 20. Most of them we focused on getting the money back. Investigation was the where we wanted to make a point of it. Um, so my real strong encouragement is try and work out how to get it back using the powers you have already. Um, if you And to do enough uh, assurance work to work out that money definitely went out incorrectly. As to when you decide to, whether you decide to formally investigate it, uh, that is up to you with some of the business grants that my feel and this is a high level feel right so i can't say this is 100 percent accurate um, but my feel is when we start looking to investigate things we may have challenges because we have pushed these payments out rather than in the majority of circumstances and all local authorities have done this differently we have pushed this out rather than uh ask people to apply for the, the thing which could give them the chance to uh, mislead us. Great, thank you. Um, so Jessica's asked if we've got any suggestions on how to encourage senior leadership and finance teams to get on board with prioritising fraud risks in a time when they're busy dealing with other COVID-19 related work. I suppose this is a perennial challenge for all of us that work in counter fraud, isn't it? I mean, how do you get senior management to take these issues seriously and to consider them as a really important risk for their businesses and authorities and organizations um yeah. yeah i mean i don't know if you've got any words of wisdom mark but it's always a difficult probably not, one probably not words of wisdom but words of experience um you can decide for yourself whether they're wise or not um so um at the root of engaging and encouraging senior leadership and finance teams is understanding what their motivators are at the moment and not and trying to align the problems to what their challenges are so we are really encouraging treasury colleagues, departmental colleagues, where the pressure is very much to get payments out quickly. We are really helping them do that while saying, well, we need to come back to this. So we're saying, let's put a pin in this, but we're using the uh, international leading practice. I mean, that is international experts. I'm not sure, I, I don't know too many um, people in our senior leadership teams and um, our very, very skilled finance teams. Who, who really know more than the international experts on how fraud works in emergency management situations. We're saying, look, the priority, we need to work with you to help get this support out to communities, but we should put a pin in this problem and come back to it. 
because it will be there. So I think that Jessica, my advice would be don't get in the way, understand their motivations, don't get in the way of what needs to happen if in your view it needs to happen, um, but make sure you're continually flagging. I said that the first starting point is accepting, accepting that fraud and irregularity is gonna happen. If we accept it, then it's easy to accept that we need to come back to it, do post event assurance work, put in frictionless controls where we can and understand the risk. Um, but the timing will be important on that because I very much suspect some organisations are um, feeling overwhelmed by the, the, the scale of the challenge at the moment to do the procurement, put the support out that is necessary. Um, and if you just add something to their pile, that would be a more of a reason for them to um, not engage with it rather than finesse it in a way which uh, they can engage with it at the right time for them. Also, I'll just come back to the point, right? We're all public servants. Uh, we, all want, um, we all want to make sure public money goes to the right places and supports the right people. Everyone has that in common. Um, so what are we doing in central government to promote independent insurance of audit reviews to specifically target fraud and corruption? So I have an interesting view on this. Um, I think we actually generally start now doing functional reviews from the account fraud function to look at corruption and fraud because there are a lot of people who um, work in the audit function who are very good fraud people and have built up skills in that, but inherently auditors aren't inherently trained to do fraud work and don't necessarily have the depth of understanding and the breadth of understanding that some people who work on fraud all the time do. Um, so we're doing two things on that. One, we are encouraging, working very closely with our internal audit function to look at, um, uh, to look at uh, what the challenges may be together and understand it. We are really focusing on this post-event assurance piece though. That, that, I mean, that's the answer really, but trying to leverage in both the expertise in the counter fraud function and the expertise in the audit function, rather than saying, right, this is about audit looking at this. It's about fraud experts with audit looking at it from my point of view, and that's the approach we're taking in central government. Very good, thank you very much. Um, and we've just had one final comment uh, about whether it's correct to talk on accepting fraud risk will increase or would acknowledging fraud risk increasing be more appropriate? I don't, I don't, I don't get the difference between accepting that risk will increase and acknowledging that risk will increase. Accepting that fraud risk increases doesn't accept that fraud levels will increase. It accepts that the risk has increased. Like if you're managing a project, um, accepting that you know if you're managing a project and you're managing a construction product and you you find uh, there's an earthquake, you accept the risk has increased that your building may fall down it doesn't mean you accept the building's going to fall down it means you take mitigating mm -hmm. actions you see what i mean so i i i don't quite get the language point on that okay um, so we're talking about I, really sort of getting across the message that emergency responses are inherently riskier from a fraud point yes. of view no, unless and they we take not. additional yeah. actions to mitigate that well, and i think that's certainly my experience um yeah, absolutely. And it's the, it's the international experts across the five eyes. So, you know, I, I, and I'm not going to argue with them. Brilliant. Um, I think we've run out of time now, unfortunately. Um, if you do have any more questions later on. Um, oh, one last question quickly about whether tools relating to self-employed falling outside of Spotlight and has yeah, there's been been Lauren, Lauren, um, Lauren yeah. no, we haven't had much progress on that. Um, we are developing tools at an incredible pace, but really some of these tools we would have taken months to develop, we're doing in weeks and days. Uh, and it's a question of prioritization. Um, so, so sadly, we haven't, we haven't got around to that yet, and I'm not sure when we will. Um, uh, it's also, uh, you know, trying to identify what the possibilities are in that space, I think. But thank you for the steer and this the challenge from the community of these are the tools we really need is really helpful because that does help us prioritize but the moment we do it quite top down it's great to have the the peer challenge as well about what we should be looking at brilliant well thank you all very much for 
joining us today. And thank you again to Mark for sparing your time in a very busy schedule. So that's been brilliant. Um, as I said before, the webinar is recorded, so it's available later to share with your colleagues. Listen again if you want to. Um, and if you have any further questions, please do email them through to me. My email address is just there on the screen. Um, but thank you all again and a special thanks to Mark. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you.